no, but, but again, I have kind of a cynical attitude toward you know <laughs> publishers. And... No, I, I think we might get into that um, a bit later. But uh, of, of course, the um, next part of the interview is kind of going to concern uh, Fortune's wealth. But uh, I need to go and take a piss first, if you allow me that. Oh, please do. You don't have to sit there with a bottle or anything. After almost a year, I returned from the washing closet to finish my interview with Benison. For those of you that don't know, Benison Lill is one of the most prominent contemporary pirate historians. A Navy SEAL veteran, he has written a multitude of books and blog posts on the subject, and was famously the historical advisor for the Stars TV series, Black Sails. He has apparently assisted me with questions regarding the period, but in this episode we'll be discussing historical fiction, writing and literature. There will also be some fun questions at the end. So please, enjoy. Audio. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hi. I can hear you well. Excellent. Uh, I see you got the swords there in the background now. As a... Yeah, I've got a better background. Hopefully this one will work. The kids and my wife are upstairs. I think they're watching uh, Star Wars. Okay. It was yeah. going to be Three Musketeers, now it's Star Wars. But a right. five-year-old's attention span changes very quickly. Yeah, I'd probably prefer the Three Musketeers, to be honest, but I mean... Um, I regard Three Musketeers, I mean, uh, Star Wars is exactly as the original was intended. It was basically an update on the old um, space operas, which were just westerns in outer space. And I don't know if you've ever seen any of the old classic American western serials that were made in the 30s, 40s, 50s. No, I haven't uh, there seen is lightweight, There is lightweight of Star Wars. I mean, it's, you know, the bad guys can't shoot straight. The plots are fairly shallow. Yeah. I mean, they're entertaining when you're kids, and I don't mind the special effects these days, but yeah, yeah, I'd much rather watch The Three Musketeers myself. Yeah. No, I haven't uh, haven't watched Star Wars either, so it's it's the same for me, you know. Um, I always wanted to ask you, like, you you told me, like, you had, like, a a swashbuckling Christmas or something along those lines. Mm Mm-hmm. It was, it's just, it... There's always something associated with pirates there, and the kids attack their presence. You know, yeah. it, it's almost like a scene from you know one of the old swashbucklers when they're plundering ships and everybody's grabbing things and tearing things open. And um, one of my adult daughters got Hugo. You need to sit down, son. Uh, one of my daughter adult daughters got uh, the kids a couple of pirate costumes, so yeah. they're running around dressed like pirates and opening yeah. all kinds of toys, and everybody's just enjoying themselves. And I'm, I'm fortunate that we've got a very uh, a family even extended family that are close by and we all get along together Mm. that's probably the only reason i'm in alabama um otherwise i'm pretty sure we'd be out of here if it weren't for family is there is there some region you'd prefer to live in you know when when i think about moving i'm not sure it's um you get tornadoes where we live there's hurricanes along the Mm. gulf and the east coasts uh i love i spent 25 years in california uh, okay. I love Southern California, but it's 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 on fire all the time now. It's yeah. you can't even afford the house. I looked at a much as I'd love to go back to Southern California. It's I kind of like having the space and a you know large yard to run in and oh, yeah. much less traffic. The traffic is horrible. It's even worse now than when I lived out there years ago, and it was bad then. Do you have some sort of pull to live close to the sea? I love living by the sea. I spent two thirds of my life by the sea, and it's it's. Mm. Uh, we're, couple of weeks we're going to head back down to the coast oh yeah for a few days but i i really do miss the sea hmm. i did it's... get up to denmark for about a week um that was a beautiful country and we wanted yeah we have a lot of plans for travel my wife and i and the kids when i get older and scandinavia is one of them you did the you did the swivel gun the thing you checked out the swivel gun in denmark, yeah, right? yeah yeah down at what is it nickabing um just um with the um, medieval center uh, yeah, they're very it's... nice people, by the way. I really enjoyed the people who were running. It was very nice. Uh, very um, uh, everything built as authentically as it could mm. could be, and um, a lot of really good people there. They were they were fun to work with. No, if it uh, no if it way. involves uh, if it involves swivel guns, then I'm always excited. It's, uh... Oh, it was the, the I know the director there has a classic quote. I'm I'm quoting him in a blog. I think, or if I haven't already, it was something to the effect of um, that no one doesn't like the smell of black powder, you know, and we were uh, creating some fire pots and we even blew a few of those up just oh, for, a little, 
nice. just black powder and it was you know that was a lot of fun yeah you know it's you know like being kids again playing with you know our little play yeah, well, uh, i mean i'm always under the impression that kids are just well adults are just grown kids you know it's I think that's the only way to live life. I mean, you've got adult responsibilities, but if you forget what it was like being a child, I think you're going to miss something. Oh, yes. Yeah. We've got a son who says, I'm never growing up. It's like Peter Pan. I'm never growing up. He's got a Peter Pan costume. even. I never really liked that character much. Mm. I love the book. Um, it's beautifully written. It's a classic, but it's one of those books that I never really identified with any of the characters uh, particularly well. And then we had a son who reminds us a lot about Peter Pan, and it gave me a very different perspective on it. On a novel, mm. it's probably one of the three works that really created a lot of the modern ideas of piracy. If you looked at, it, I'd say probably Treasure Island, that, and then maybe Captain Blood, those three novels, mm. and they also got us away from the real history too significantly. Yeah. And yeah. in some ways, I think Treasure Island is probably closer, it's more accurate, <laughs> yeah, you know, more realistic, and it's not entirely so. He, uh, Stevenson created, a, invented a few. Uh, tropes himself to push his narrative along mm. it's probably closer than they all than all three of them but yeah there's a lot in peter pan about just not really looking at it from the perspective of piracy but just the perspective of um you know life in general and growing up and what it means to be a child and what it means to grow up and, mm. uh he doesn't pull any of the punches when it comes to you know the darkness and the things that even children will see and say sometimes too so yeah. it's worth a read it's a pirate history by any means, but yeah. at least it will help um, understand where a lot of the pirates of today, why we tend to regard pirates the way we do. Ah, Hugo, ah, sorry, uh, cat in my lap. He was sitting on the cord and just tried to bite me when I pushed him out of my lap, trying to pick him up. Wow. He's getting old and he's getting crankier. Is that better? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, since we're... Um... I guess we might as well start with the questions then, since we were sure. talking about books as well. Um, so of course we're gonna we're mostly gonna talk about uh, your own book, uh, Fortune's Whelp. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't you start by giving us an introduction to it? What what's it about? I would call it a prequel or part one of what's intended as a three part series of novels. It was originally written, probably in the very late '80s, intending to write um, a practice novel. Um, uh, heavily researched, try to make a more authentic, updated version of the classic swashbuckling romance. Um, something that in my mind at least would appeal equally well, um, like a lot of the novels of Raphael Sabatini to both men and women. Um, you know, strong female characters in there, the, plenty of the romance. Um, and when I f the first finished uh, the manuscript that ran, I would plan on 100 to 150,000 words. It went 250 to 300,000, I think. It was excessively long. Um, it was probably no market for that kind of novel back then, and it really isn't one today, unfortunately, for more of your classic swashbucklers. And I'm hoping it'll, it'll roll back around one day, but there's really just not a market for it right now. Even Perez Verte, the Spanish author, um, the sixth or seventh book he had in his series of early 17th century swashbucklers, the Alatriste novels, yeah. couldn't even get translated into English because of sales, and they're excellent books. So if he's not making it, you know, it could be quite difficult to get them. But um, I made a lot of mistakes early on writing novels. Um, one of the first things I learned is you might want to describe a long sea voyage, but the bad way to do that is to make the writing boring, like long sea voyages generally are, unless it's a storm or something. Um, Actually, I don't know if you've ever read a semi-obscure novel. It's called Captain Margaret by John Maysfield, the poet who did Sea Fever and all that. Uh, no, I've I been not. trying to work my way through that novel, and it's uh, about half of it is a sea voyage and most of it's conversation. This is supposed to be a late 17th century swashbuckler, and um, he seems to, I hate criticizing other authors, but he seems to have made a similar mistake. It's like I'm, he presents a long sea voyage beautifully, but it's also boring, which long sea voyages tend to be. And a lot of conversation, you're just itching for something to happen. So I made a lot of mistakes like that early on. And then I not find, being able to find a publisher for some years, I put it aside. Uh, and then, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, I took it back out and decided to rewrite it, break it into shorter novels, um, get rid of the heavy emphasis on romance, um, toss that out, which required or entailed a lot of changes um, to characters. And I also needed... A different narrative arc to carry it along. It's essentially a story of a former buccaneer, a man who'd been a naval officer, a buccaneer, a privateer. Uh, he's had some um, 
incidents that have kind of laid him low in cash and he's stuck in England. He's a Scotsman, basically, or yeah. really a Scottish American. Yeah. Uh, and so he's spending his time trying to get a commission. And it's kind of like the last of the Buccaneers, really. He's going to get his commission, sail to the Caribbean, you know, rescue his true love originally. Um, and go on. So I broke it down into three novels. Uh, the first one I did manage to find a small publisher for. Um, had some issues with that publisher. Um, other people have too. So I have not um, tried publishing the sequel with him or anybody else. I have had some encouragement recently to find other publishers and some suggestions. Mm. Um, hopefully this spring or summer I'll have time to get off and start doing that. Um, finding publishers could be uh, quite a tedious, long drawn out process yeah. to do. But um, anyway, it's basically a swashbuckling adventure um, set mostly at sea. And I know what your next question is going to be. Why is the first novel mostly set ashore? Um, but set mostly at sea in the Caribbean during the, the last gasp or grasp of the Buccaneers um, fighting against Spain, yeah. essentially. And um, I had to, uh, I, the narrative arc, I switched, as I said, I switched from romance to something that had much more to do with intrigue. Yeah. yeah. And it's based historically on fact. I mean, I've taken some liberties, but not extensive liberties legitimate attempts at rebellion um and essentially you've got a man who doesn't really want to be involved with any of these things um mm. and circumstance ends up sticking him in the middle of these um things and all of which are kind of getting in his way of doing what he wants of getting that commission but in the end it's these very same circumstances conspire to be what results in him actually getting a privateering commission being able to go on his voyage and that's a bit of the theme of the first novel anyway is that I don't care how well you plan, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men and all that, they tend to fall apart. And we're never really entirely sure what's going on around us, the forces that are pushing us in one direction or another. You know, we can do our best. Also ties in with the uh, title itself, Fortune's Wealth. You know, yeah. someone who's basically a, almost a bastard of fortune or a child of fortune. It's, you know, we're all victims of circumstance to some degree, whether we want to admit it or not. You know, it doesn't really matter how much free will we have or how much we think we have, you know, whether that's an illusion or how much we plan. In other words, you have to be able to adapt. Um, I know people who've watched Hollywood movies and think that Navy SEALs, it's all because they're strong and fast. And that has nothing to do with it. It's, it's teamwork and adaptability. And those are the two things that, you know, keep you going. And mm. if you can, in life in general, I'm not trying to, you know, become a, some kind of a life coach or philosopher here, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm not that much of a um, con man, I don't think. Um, you know, <laughs> oh. try to sell nonsense like that. No. no. Um, uh, I mean, I think I think the theme definitely of this um, so sort of like randomness it also fits into the uh, pre-industrial period because uh, so much more is based. I mean, you're so much more susceptible to uh, to luck, to fortune, to the elements. Like even just setting yes. sail, you know, you can't just set sail mm -hmm. whenever you want. You you need a good wind. You know. Yeah, it's you can't predict the weather. You don't know what's on the other side of the ocean. It, it's you know, mm. yeah. It's people were much by nature much greater risk takers, mm. and that in a lot of ways that's probably a good thing. I wish pe modern populations were willing to take more risks. Mm. I don't think human nature fundamentally changes over centuries. I no. really don't. It's just your your local circumstances and culture may be different, but humans are humans, and everywhere I've traveled throughout the world, uh, people pretty much seem the same. They may behave differently based on culture but you uh, you mentioned before of course that the uh, the second book is set in the caribbean but the the first book fortune's Whelp, it's uh, uh, takes place in england uh, so so why did you choose england as the uh, as the starting point uh i was uh, for a number of reasons the one of the, the the predominant female character i intended her to be irish um so i figured it would be a good place uh, to start in the uk or across the channel from Ireland. Um, it turned out that historically, a number of privateers were outfitted in Bristol and chose that because it began across the channel from Ireland. Um, yeah. Kinsale in Ireland was, it was a small naval station there and it was a lot of privateers, including Woods Rogers, that actually stopped there for provisioning and recruiting en route. Yeah. And like I said, the first novel, it's really just the first part is in England in ireland and then after that you get to the caribbean but once i broke these things up the first one basically ended up entirely in england and i had to add some action scenes in there i um had him become a naval officer uh 
which is actually historically based. In fact, you wouldn't think a buccaneer might become, but there were occasionally, less so in, in England, I think, than in France, but occasionally buccaneers, including a renegade like Bartholomew Sharp, uh, were actually offered a commission. Sharp never took his up in England, yeah. probably a good thing um, for <laughs> England and yeah. the, the English Navy. Um, but also, I figured, having done some research, you find that some of Henry Every's crew landed in Ireland, and eventually I thought, well, that's too good to avoid, so we'll stick that mm -hmm. in there sometime, too. And mm -hmm. I think I, I think it was in Fortune's Whelp, and it's definitely some in the sequel as well. Yeah. Um, so basically try to meld and blend all these historical events as legitimately as, as I can do. Um, try not to change dates or have things out of chronological order. And so that's why I said it there in England. There's um, plenty going on. Um, there's, you know, it's, uh, I think another influence for sticking in Bristol was um, the King's Baths there. I just thought there'd be a oh, nice yeah. scene that I could set in the King's Baths. And there's actually a couple of some, not only plants, but some nice illustrations from late 17th century. And you can almost look at one of the illustrations and just start imagining conversations and things that are going on there. So, yeah. Uh, just a lot of influence there. Yeah, so that's a very interesting thing, actually, because if you if you look at the cities from this period, um, so yeah, once again, I kind of have a hard time formulating this, but you kind of you can't just do whatever with whatever city. What what I mean is that, for example, Bristol in seventeen ten did not have a theater, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not sure if um, if London had any bathhouses like the one you describe in Bristol. So uh, certain things you can't do in certain cities. You have to like adapt. I guess it's kind of cool in a way, you know, that these cities are uh, so unique in that sense. Yeah, there's a, we'll I'll probably mention it later when we talk about um, Treasure Light Press and Captain Blood, but there are, you know, it's, if you have a lot of time for research, you can avoid mistakes like this. But if you, you're on a deadline of writing a novel a year, you're probably going to make mistakes. Like I know um, the Cinco Yagas or Diarabella and Captain Blood is, it was, according to Sabatini, built in Cadiz, but there were no shipyards in Cadiz at the time. Mm. Um, oh, okay. That kind of that segues me nicely into the question of, um, if there are any personal experiences that um, shape the characters or the events in the book? Um, a, a lot of them. I was. I figured the best way to stay honest in writing a novel is try to draw from personal experience um, rather than trying to invent um, or imagine um, personal experiences. So uh, the character himself is somewhat based on me, but with m more extremes, good or bad, than I would have. Um, he's probably more capable um, in general than I was. Or I am, um, so or more lucky, right? And more lucky, <laughs> probably a lot of ways. Uh, so that was number one. Uh, a lot of his attitudes, a lot of the incidents, even uh, were drawn from similar personal experiences. Um, his injury in a duel was actually um, very similar to an injury I had um, in the navy. We had a freak accident. Two of us putting a um, zodiac through the surf during a reconnaissance in Hawaii, and I ended up getting a just wave of the week just a couple waves melded just uh, the boat um uh, the coxswain was having a um, hard time getting the outboard motor started we had this large maritime outboard motors for special operations and mm. so i jumped i was holding the bow and in, into the waves to keep us from broaching and figured as soon as he got it uh, fired up i'd pull over the tube climb into the boat which is almost what happened but every occasionally you know you've been by the sea you'll see a couple of waves will just kind of meld and you might have tiddly little two to three foot surf and then suddenly there's a you know five or six foot wave just suddenly appearing out of nowhere and that just right there it came in plunged over the boat he kicked it in gear which probably shouldn't have done and i was climbing and that wave hit hard enough that it pulled me up under into the motor so part of the experience and descriptions there is just you know from what i remember we you know i was riding the back of one of these navy pickups to get to the hospital a couple of hours away and um at the doctor was it was the weekend it was an army hospital and uh, there was only one surgeon on orthopedic surgeon on call and he was in surgery and um he sent word down not to give me any medications or anything so he wanted to check for nerve damage mm -hmm. and i can tell you that after a couple of hours the endorphins wear off pretty quickly and yeah. then he came down and was probing away you know just poking around in these open wounds on my feet and ankle um and I was cussing quite a bit through my teeth. It was, you know, so I, you know, it's experiences like that, they work well because you can dry it, you can write it from firsthand experience. And during that certain situations also with people, there are some characters that I've known. Uh, I think in the novel, I call him um, Handsome Harry. 
Yeah. That's uh, based on an admiral I knew who's called to gave him his own nickname, Gorgeous George. Um, um, yeah. But yeah, I picked a lot of these characters out just from life experiences, um, everything from attitudes, but especially from things I see. And this goes back to the theory of I don't think people really change. So, you know, mm. I mean, read Sam of Peeps' his journals. You'd say, oh, yeah. I know this guy and I know that guy. And I've seen all these things happen before. <laughs> Um, and it, I, it may be easier to write that way, but I also think it's much more honest mm. to write that way when you're writing about things that you have seen or have experienced rather than trying to imagine what two characters might do if they got together. It can be entertaining, but I'm not sure how legitimate that is sometimes. Right. I mean, the the main point, point of literature is, of course, to uh, convey a feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I think I think also the 1600s is, uh, is such a great pick for writing historical fiction that's uh, similar to our experiences because... I mean, it's uh, the, the the culture back then wasn't really that different if you compare it to like the Victorian era. It's I think the 1600s mm -hmm. was uh, much more uh, similar to a lot of our attitudes today. Um, yeah, I think that's a good insight. It, it's it's uh, and unfortunately, there's not as much literature in that area as I would like to see. Oh yeah, um, definitely. And a lot of people don't really know that era very well. Either, yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah, uh, they had their equivalent of. Uh, you know, these little whispers on social media and, and false flags. And so I read accounts of, you know, uh, you literally have propagandist agents come in and just, you know, try to start whispering in crowds or, you know, making up rumors that they'd heard and things. And yeah. but you see it the same. It's it's easier today with social media, but they were doing the same thing back then. Yeah, it was just slower. Just a lot slower. And even then, I'm amazed at how quickly um, things will move sometimes. And I've actually gotten into this with an editor one time, too, who was tried to tell me that, oh, you could just walk off a ship and slip into society. And I was like, not really. Ships have manifests. You had to have passes. They checked them when they anchored. And a notorious, you know, or a famous or notorious or infamous individual is probably going to be well known. And word could actually pass fairly well. There's a um, memoir by an Irishman, uh, late 17th, early 18th century, named Peter Drake. Uh, it's a fascinating memoir. He was, um, you know, he left Ireland, went to Europe, fought for the French and other places. But mm. he fought a duel one morning in a French port. I can't remember which port it was offhand. Um, but, you know, and back then, dueling was not a formally regulated affair in most cases. It was two guys just want to fight. They go out and find a quiet place and you don't turn your back on them. So you might get stabbed in the back. They draw swords and, you know and go at it and he killed this guy and out behind some building somewhere and Shit. for the whole day he was worried that somebody might have noticed him going there but by that late afternoon everybody in that town knew about it and that's you know they don't have telephones they didn't have social media but word mm. spread that fast within 24 hours or not 24 hours 12 hours that everybody was talking about the man found dead killed in a duel or who killed him and you know the authorities are searching and everything else and you know people can gossip travels pretty fast so what, what were the main inspirations behind the main character, Edward McNaughton? Um, probably just a lot of uh, things I had done in my own life, reflections and philosophies. I had, um, you know, my family's from the South in the U.S. I did not grow up in the South. I live here now, but I really consider myself more of an expatriate. Um, yeah. And I was looking for a character, something like that. I, a, a fair part of my ancestry is Scottish and mm. the Scots, in the 17th, even the 18th century, were not regarded perhaps as poorly by the English as the Irish were, but still fairly Polish. It was considered this, you know, even the lowlands of Scotland were considered to be, you know, semi-barbaric and the highlands extremely barbaric. Um, so I kind of built a character who would be um, of both lowland and highland Scots, but whose father had been a seaman, had been with Morgan, or not Morgan, but with um, the English at 1655 and a later sailed with Morgan, and then it settled in Virginia. So you've really got what some people would have called an American Creole or a Scots Creole. It's a, a man who may have been born in um, Scotland, but he was really raised in the Americas. So he's kind of caught between the worlds. The English really don't like that much because, you know, he's both Scottish and American. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of reflected my own background and my own kind of ambivalence um, to the South in some ways. Um, I had a, a year of severe culture shock when I was 10 years old. Um, my father was in the Navy. We lived in Japan for a couple of years and I'd lived in California before that and Florida and all these other places. I never really lived in Alabama. I visited family there and I loved that, but I actually hadn't lived in the place. But for one year, while my father was gonna be on an extended deployment off of the coast of Vietnam on an aircraft carrier, 
they figured it'd be a good idea and a lot cheaper to go back to Alabama rather than living in San Diego um, for what put him out to a year. And for me, it was just utter culture shock, you know, the, the deep South at the height of the civil rights movement. Yeah. And um, it was not something I was really prepared for a lot of the attitudes and everything else um, at that time. And, and those memories may have shaped a bit of his character as well. You know, somebody who definitely is like, you know, this is where my family comes from, but I don't really quite fit in here. Mm. It's kind of like being an insider and an outsider simultaneously. Yeah. So I took these things and kind of wanted to build it into the same character. Who's He's not really sure where in the um, world he's placed. The way he's grown up, he's he, he doesn't care for monarchs. You can't really go out and promote that in the 17th century. Um, you know, it didn't work very well for people who did uh, back then. But he's that's another reason he may have been drawn to become a buccaneer in his past is mm. because at least that was a, a democratic society, only among themselves. They weren't trying to export democracy. Mm. But um, among themselves, it was very much a, a democratic um, form of government. Right. Uh, I also drew a lot of my experiences uh, as a naval officer, Navy SEAL. There's a lot of, right. tactically at least, there's a lot of similarities. And also, yeah. both of those draw a lot of similar type of characters and personalities. You know, I can read the old Buccaneer journals and say, I know a guy just like that, and I know a guy just like that. And, you know, you start picking these people out. You've seen very similar personality. I mean, I, but. Bartholomew Sharp in the flesh and, you know, other people like that. Guys who were great operators, but they also had character flaws that, mm. you know, might keep them from advancing as well as they might, you know. But on the other hand, there are guys that in a dark alley or in a, in a battle you want at your side, mm. you know. Yeah. I'm curious yeah, about the... Uh, back in. I'm curious about the, the main rival, the one that he... Uh, I forgot the name, uh, but the one he duels and uh, duels at the beginning and then eventually kills in the uh, in the back alley. Is he is he based on on someone? Uh, probably. <laughs> when I was very young and naive, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to kill an enemy in every novel. If I can't do that, I'm going to kill a lawyer in every novel. <laughs> and I know, and I know some, and that somewhere some lawyer is going to hear this and go, "You're fomenting anger," and you know that that doesn't help. You know, oh. you know peace, you know, whatever. You know, it's, yeah. The so a lot of these, some of them are composites. Of other people too and i didn't want to try to make them characters but they're definitely i've uh, i'd say pretty much every character in there the non-historical characters are drawn from real life people i have known occasionally composites of people i've known for the historical characters i did the best i could based on um, assessments of them back then on what their character might be mm. um and again in some ways the novel is it's not as put together as well as I did because, like I said, I did a major rewrite. I wanted to keep a lot of the set pieces. I had to add a lot, and then um, I had to completely uh, add a new narrative arc in there. And a lot of the plot has to do with, you know, intrigue that wasn't in the first version. You speak a lot about the uh, the intrigue, of course, um, and of course, not uh, not everyone is going to be uh, certain what you're referring to. But the book book is set this in uh, 1697, right? Yeah, or sixteen ninety six, right before the war ends. Basically. So, what uh, what was the uh, what is what what does the main intrigue in the book uh, center around? There was an, uh, a legitimate attempt to replace King William or William and Mary, who had been brought over in sixteen eighty eight, and yeah, from, James uh, from the Netherlands. Yes, and James II deposed. Um, William was what a grandson of um, James I. So anyway, England uh, William. Did have English ancestry as well, and his wife, of course, was what James II's daughter. And but James II still had strong support in England, minority, but a fairly strong support. And he was in the exile, I guess, at what Saint Germain in France at the time. And there would continue to be attempts by Jacobites to place James or one of his children up until basically Culloden in the mid 18th century in Scotland, but it was finally yeah. put to rest. And there was a plot to uh, a, a lot of Irishmen and disaffected opportunists and um, English Jacobites to assassinate King William II. Um, they got wind of it. There's, there was um, someone who had actually been approached to participate in the plot declined and he informed. And so they were um, basically, they just didn't go where he was supposed to be. And then after, a, I think, um, after twice William not appearing where they expected him to appear in his carriage, um, they realized that the jig was up and everybody went every way they could. This Irishman was um, one of them. Mm. 
who's taking off. And Edward McNaughton, of course, by quite by accident almost has run across, found some of the, uh, has learned this plot. He tries to bring it to, you know, the king. He doesn't get to the king, of course, because kings don't see people like that. He, he gets as far as, um, um, but anyway, Edward McNaughton ultimately gets rewarded for this because yeah. even if his wasn't the intelligence that they actually had and already knew, the fact that he came forward and tried to do this. He doesn't get the reward at first that he actually wants. They give him a commission of a small English vessel to track down his um, Irish friend. Mm -hmm. And so that allowed me an opportunity to bring in another local you know, small scale sea battle in there. And that's also based on historical actions. Yeah. Um, I had one when I was writing that scene, I don't want to go too much into detail, but there is a, a scene where there's the, uh, the two vessels are board and board locked together and McDonald has captured one of them. Um, but there's another, I believe it's a privateer coming bearing down on it. And so I thought, well, tactically it would be great um, if this other enemy vessel thought that they were still engaged that way it wouldn't fire into both vessels. You know, if they captured it, it might fire into both vessels. But if they think there's still an active fight going on, they wouldn't. And I thought, well, that's a stretch. I haven't seen this historically. But I actually found an instance of that uh, <laughs> a few years after I'd written the scene, which, you know, you think, ah, it's brilliant. I, you know, I got this one right. Um, and it was... Um, was that, before, it was was that before or after you published it that you found the evidence? Oh, it was after I published it. I ran oh. across it. But it was the life it was an English, um, I believe it was a man of war, it might have been a privateer attacking a Portuguese vessel under the guns of a Portuguese fort. And they actually boarded and captured it but to prevent the fort from firing upon them, because which it certainly would have if yeah. they realized the vessel had been captured, they kept the flags up and they created a false fire in action as if the engagement was still going to prevent the fort from firing upon them until they could completely secure the vessels and then sail on. So, you know, occasionally you run across things and it's wonderful. You're like, ah, I got it right. You know, mm. I could have been a captain back then. <laughs> but uh, what, what are your goals or intentions behind uh, writing the Fortune Swap series? Uh, well, the main purpose originally was just to try to see if we could make an effort and get people to actually start reading, you know, novels, swashbuckling type novels set in this period. I did mm -hmm. not want to set them uh, somewhat Sabatini-esque in the sense that I didn't want to write just a purely pirate or buccaneer novel. I wanted to bring broader history into it and set these, you know, there's a lot going on, you know, piracy is just a small which was, was a very small part of what's going on. And just try to bring a lot of the history in there, introduce and, and to some degree educate people on history or at least make them inch more interested in history in the period. Um, uh, I have written a sequel to that. I have the, um, the third part in draft. Um, mm -hmm. Sequel has a lot more, I think, action and adventure in it. There's, you know, uh, all kinds of personalities working together. There's a raid on Port Bay and San Domingue. Mm -hmm. Based historically, this could be a fictional raid, but it's based on a historical raid, uh, although smaller scale. Uh, a lot more intrigue going in there, but also intending to introduce the reader to the politics of what was actually going on in this region. I mean, the, uh, it's a fascinating period that unfortunately has been largely overlooked. Right. Um, everywhere, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Um, I think in the UK, they're probably much more familiar with it, certainly, than Americans are. Uh, you have a problem in the, the U.S. Pirate history, as far as Americans are concerned, is very early 18th century, and it's yeah. Blackbeard. Yeah. Um, in spite of the fact you have these these really epic sea rovers, you know, from the previous century, um, we have, you know, in St. Augustine, Florida, you have this beautiful Spanish Castillo that yeah. a lot of people in this country don't even realize is there, you know, or the importance it played, you know, during COVID. Here in Alabama, it's history is basically civil war, I think, hmm. you know, is the way they look at it. Although you have this, you know, wonder, you have Mobile, Alabama, where the French had settled early on, you know, you have um, Carolinian um, traders and Native American slave hunters coming down through the region, uh, fomenting Native American wars. Um, you know, you have the Spanish in Florida, lots of explorations. There's a lot of history here that people don't even know about it and don't seem to be that interested in. It's unfortunate too, but I mean, there's a whole swashbuckling history going on down here that people don't seem to get. I know um, fantasy seems to be what's getting published right now when it comes to whether it's piracy or anything like that. Have you even had a couple of people suggest, well, why don't you just write pirate novels in a fantasy realm? And I say, well, it's, I don't know that my heart would be in doing that. You know, it's it's, the reality is interesting enough and mm. in a lot of ways more interesting, I think. 
Mm. And I'd much rather stick to that, but we'll see. I will try to get the books published. There's always a chance. I don't really want to self-publish now for a lot of reasons, but down the road, if that's always a possibility. If I did that, it would be done as legitimately as possible, you know, with a good editor. Um, I know a couple of outstanding editors, one of which we're using for the, to edit my annotations for um, Captain Blood mm. for our little publishing house. I really don't want to self-publish, but if, I mean, worst case down the road, I might consider doing that if I could do it in a, you know, quality means, you know, I don't really want to publish primarily digital. I'd rather have hardcover, softcover, very traditional publishing. Yeah. Um, I, it, I just like having real books and a lot of people, readers that I know like having real books, you know, hard mm. copies that they can hold in their hand. It, but mm, you mentioned before other like uh, pirate novels and uh, this isn't the question i wrote down before it's just something i was curious about what what kind of pirate novels or do you think that people are interested in nowadays at the moment um i'm honestly not sure what the modern younger reader is in i know there's a there's a uh, it's probably a pretty good youth market for pirate novels with younger characters and i know my daughter my adult daughters have i have most of their childhood library here at the house and there's a lot of, um, you know, young adult novels associated, historical type associated with piracy um, that they like. Um, as for adults, I'm honestly not sure. Fantasy, you know, that's it, it seems to be going pretty well. But again, as we discussed, that's not an area I'm really interested in yeah. in writing. Um, I know there have been a, there have been some pirate novels. It used to be quite a popular genre uh, starting about the yeah. late 19th century up through probably the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, unfortunately, I think film may have had something to do with it. Once you started getting pirates as caricatures in some of the films, mm. you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, and a lot of failures, that may have put a lot of people off on the genre. Mm. And it's, it's you know, it's become almost Disney-fied. I love the, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. It's fun, but um, mm. it, the sub areas become caricatured and Disney-fied in a lot of ways. And um, I think a lot of people just don't take it seriously or as seriously as they, yeah. they could, you know, and trying to find a publisher who's willing to take a risk on a, you know, a novel like that is mm. again, you know, publishers want to make money and, and getting fiction published is much more difficult than it is to get nonfiction published. You can. Yeah. You know. I think that pirates need some sort of rebranding. And one of those things that I've uh, thought about is that, and I think they should really be classified as criminals because they're more so, uh, they were more so in this period a, a sort of paramilitary organization, mm -hmm. um, especially if yes. you look at their roots. You know they date back to these, um, the uh, you know the Dutch uh, sea rovers and the Huguenots in the 1500s, where you know rebel mm -hmm. rebel groups, Protestant rebel yes. groups, Protestant extremists. Mm -hmm. and, you know the uh, the Buccaneers date back to those groups as well, and you know a lot mm -hmm. of the Buccaneers were also from uh, Cromwell's army, and you know they, yep. um, I mean they didn't really have political. I guess you could say that about probably most paramilitary groups. They they probably don't have any real goals. They probably just love violence and uh, mm -hmm. plunder. So, yeah. and the uh, I mean even even the um, even the early eighteenth century pirates. You know, I mean I agree with you that they're way oversaturated. Um, it's mm -hmm. also the same. You see them as a they can be seen as a paramilitary group. They were these former uh, mm -hmm. former servants of the state in the loose sense. Yes. Um, and cut loose, and that's been a danger historically. It's what you do with paramilitary forces and oh, mercenaries. Yeah. That, you know, it, you either keep them under control or find a way to break them or to disband them or to cause trouble if they're. Mm. I mean, if that's their livelihood, and you take it away, it's, it's going to be problems. You saw that a lot in Europe, in Europe, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance. Yeah, the mercenary groups. No, and I think I think that's something that's um, very relevant today because uh, you got like the what's going on in Ukraine and uh, in mm -hmm. a lot of these regions you have a lot of paramilitary groups that's mm -hmm. been active. Uh, but I mean, also I guess in the early uh, early nineteen hundreds you had a lot of the paramilitary groups in Germany like the um, Freikorps. Mm -hmm. The I guess you could call the uh, I forgot what they were called the um, uh, one of the Nazi wings, which eventually got purged. Uh, I guess that's one way you can deal with the paramilitaries yeah. is to uh, kill them off. Yeah, um, yeah, kill them off. That's, um, <laughs> yeah, people need to read history and they actually need to learn something from it. And it's hard enough to get them to read history and it's even harder to get them to learn from it. So hmm. so you, you mentioned that your current project is a 100-year anniversary of uh, edition of Captain Blood. Um, tell us more about it. 
Uh, it was a favorite novel of my youth. Um, it's a classic romance. It's had a lot of influence on how people look at piracy today. It's kind of the gentleman pirate, you know, is, is seeking revenge because he's been done wrong by the state. Um, classic film version with Errol Flynn. Um, I think it's been continuously in print and uh, it's still read quite a bit today. It's um, historically, it's not a perfect novel. Um, it, uh, but again, it, it, he was uh, Sabatini was probably a better writer of historical fiction than, a, than most writers were. He tried to do more research into it. It's but again, given his timetable, it's uh, often imperfect. Um, but I really like the the novel because of some of the influence that it's had on me. So my wife and I decided we'd form a small publishing company, a legitimate publishing company, and we try to publish annotated editions of you know some classic swashbucklers. Um, Pandemic has put us well behind, probably a year, year and a half behind, but we're still hoping to get the, it published out by the end of the year so we can legitimately call it a 100th anniversary annotated edition. Um, the annotations are extraordinarily thorough. They're probably word count run at least the word count of the novel itself. And uh, we mentioned something about illustrations earlier. I want to have a center section with probably two to 300 illustrations. I've got most of them already pulled, tagged, and captioned um, already. But the point of the annotations is in part to explain things that the reader might not know and doesn't really have time to go research on the internet. Uh, it is not to criticize the book per se. Um, I will point out if there is some subtle or you know minor but obvious races, racism, I'll point out, mm -hmm. uh, we'll point that out in annotation and also point out how common it was back then. Mm -hmm. um, that if the novel had been written today, you probably wouldn't see that. Um, point out, um, it's not meant to say, hey, he screwed up at this, you know, this spot. This is not how the history was. It's to just factually say, this is what he either thought or had. This is what he's trying to depict. Here's the reality. You know, the, um, you know, the white indentured servants in Barbados may have considered themselves slaves, but under the law they weren't. They weren't treated nearly as badly as African slaves, which are only barely even touched on the novel, for example. Mm. Um, so I try to put the novel in a historical perspective, but also just provide extra information for people reading the book so they could know where he got his sources. I uh, uh, discovered a lot of his sources where he probably got certain ideas and things like that. We go into detail there, but it's the annotations are meant to foster enjoyment of the book. Um, and I know for a lot of people like me who read the book, it actually inspired a sense that of studying history. I've even got a German edition from the 30s mm. uh, with penciled in notes in it um, in the um, on the flyleaf and inside the cover. And you can see that this person is just writing notes like, who is this person? And you can see it literally inspiring and interest in history. Um, I exchanged a few letters with um, George McDonald Frazier, who wrote the Flashman series and the comic novel, The Pirates, and things some years ago before he died. Okay. Um, and was just, you know, uh, talking to him about this and the inspiration for it and I mentioned that it had actually fostered my interest in very real history and wondering what, you know, even not just Buccaneers, but just history in general, and, mm. uh, European history. It also helped foster my interest in languages and things like that. And he said that it had done much the same thing for it. It's a novel that um, there's a, a number of great writers who said it's one of the first, you know, novel they really enjoyed or it, it inspired them to become a novelist um it's mm, yeah. um so anyway the annotations are meant to foster readers enjoyment and understanding of the novel they're not meant to be as a critical like you know somebody going on and saying this is an awful novel he got everything wrong he got a lot right he got a lot wrong but that's very common in historical novels um and um really just kind of provide a broader perspective for the reader on the period of what was actually going on. It's a fascinating period, the 1680s in the Caribbean. Um, it's based on very real history. You know, I'll even have an appendix, short appendix talking about Henry Pittman, whose journal mm, yeah. um, Sabatini read. And that's basically the reason we have the novel. Uh, mm -hmm. I even put a blog up recently speculating on who the, you know, the imagine the, uh, the unknown or incognito pirate captain who rescued Pittman. Oh, yeah. If that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have Captain Blood. Yeah. Um, uh, but so we're hoping to get that done by this fall. I'm probably 80% finished with the annotations. They turned out to be a lot more work than I'd expected because partly I just got into them, started going down a lot of rabbit holes. Um, <laughs> and they started getting longer and longer. Uh, some areas that I thought I had a decent enough knowledge, like the Monmouth Revolution, 
a rebellion, fail rebellion in England that uh, the novel opens up with. I thought I knew it well enough, but Sabatini has so many little details and names in there that I found that I had to do an extensive about a additional research just to understand this and add the annotations and things, which is good for me. It's an excuse for me to learn more about the period. So um, annotations will be very thorough, uh, well illustrated, um, all designed to foster a greater understanding of the book. I've got Ruth Heredia, Sabatini's biography has done an introduction to it. She's a, a very close friend of mine. It's been fun for me. It's given me a chance to go back and, you know, uh, add knowledge to area things I thought I knew well enough. Um, to uh, Sabatini, he was influenced by Lawrence de Graff. He's, there are scenes from, you know, Lawrence de Graff that he actually incorporated in his novels. And I've got some little... Um, and, and with a, putting a, a recommendation to people that if you haven't read the novel, the first thing you should do if you get this edition is read the novel first. Mm. And it's worth rereading a second time, then go back and reread it and then start flipping through and reading the annotations and, you know, try to avoid, you know, losing a sense of the narrative, yeah. you know, and forgetting where you were in a book. Read it through first and then go back and start looking at the annotations and, and studying the history or at least look at them separately, you know, read the chapter, then look at the annotations. Well, anyway, we're hopeful we'll get this out by the end of the year. All right. Yeah, it's something we'll uh, we'll have to look forward to. It uh, sounds very exciting. Uh, opportunity to learn a lot. Uh, I remember la last uh, last time we talked about it, you talked something about the uh, uh, Spanish uh, sweets or something along those lines. Oh yeah, that's another rabbit hole I went down, and it, it turns out that they're yeah the um, sweet beets, um, and I'm I'm a hundred percent certain Sabatini picked up. He may have picked up the term from Excavelling's. Um, descriptions of you know sharp and south sea voyage where they're mentioned in there but john maysfield that we talked about earlier briefly had picked up used them in that novel i was talking about captain margaret and mm. there's enough other details in there of ships and it, they're actually incorrect maysfield was a seaman a sailor but he'd sailed on tall ships in the late 19th century and the terminology is very different from the 17th century and a lot of sabatini's descriptions of how ships work i'm almost certain he cribbed it from maysfield who was relying on his own experience, you know, sailing around the horn on clippers. Yeah. And um, I'm pretty sure Sabatini may have taken the sweet meats because he Maysfield mentions Peruvian sweet meats. And these are the kind of holes I go down to. So you get it there. And then you see Sabatini using it in other novels. And um, then you have George McDonald Frazier, who we mentioned, who's a fan of Sabatini. And he uses it in his novel, The Pirates. And in another one of his comic novels, the last one he wrote before his death about uh, border reavers, he uses the same phrase. And then I've got to find out what these sweet meats were. So I end up finding paintings and thank God for the internet and hanging the Prado because I've been there, but you know, I can't go back right now and just to look up, see if they have a painting of sweet meats. But, by, you know, but they, they do and you find other paintings and then... You start finding historical documentation and figuring out exactly what these sweet meats might have been, you know. And some of them are still made today, so you order some and you eat it, you know. And you go down and, you know, it's, it's, it's just fun history and the excuse to have some have some fun and then write, you know, five hundred or more words in an annotation, a single annotation on sweet meats, you know, regarding everything we just said, basically where he got the idea, probably, and mm. what they were actually like and everything else. I mean, it's also such I a thing, the, uh, the military and the naval stuff. I mean, it's also such a rabbit hole. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. most people, you know, especially if you look in this period, a lot of people think that uh, fusee or fusil, it's just, uh, it's just a synonym for gun. No, it's specifically mm -hmm. a flintlock gun. You know, stuff yes, like that. and they, yeah, uh, well, it's, there's also, a, there's a certain anti, and a lot of at least American scholars, a lot of them are very anti military in the sense that they kind of disdain it they don't think they really need to study it or that they shouldn't yeah. study it you know warfare is ugly but it's also a strong part of human history you really need to have people studying it closely because maybe we wouldn't have so much if they did you know instead of just saying no that's you know a horrible thing and you know there was i mean i think wrong? i think there's a lot of hip hypocrisy there as well you know like everyone likes mm -hmm. watching a watching a war movie i think i think we should just admit that mm -hmm. we're atta attached to violence to some degree we are. I bet, you know, younger generations than me. Oh, and I grew up, you know, every little boy in America, you know, for Christmas when you were five years old, you got a pair of six guns, like in the cowboy movies and yeah. you know, cap guns, bang, bang, and shoot. And now, you know, parents are like, no, you can't do that. But they'll let their kids go play video games and they're when they're racking up a thousand kills. And I'm like, you know, I'm pretty sure my kill count when I had as a kid with my little toy six guns wasn't anywhere near what your, your child is racking up on a video game, you know, so. Yeah. 
this, this is another question I didn't write down because I came up with it today. I think. Uh, do you have any? Do you have any books specifically, nonfiction that are unpublished? Uh, I have part of one, um, unpublished right now. I. And this was actually one looking at the history of pirate, our modern culture, basically how we got there. And um, my agent's not interested in it. You know, a couple of publishers I sent it to weren't interested. One scholarly publisher wanted me to rewrite it a couple of times and then said no. Um, I got ghosted by a couple of publishers sending it out, which I thought was kind of interesting because it would seem like that's the kind of book you someone might want to publish. You know, just here's an example of how we, you know, fact becomes fiction and vice versa. Mm. Um, so I have it on hold right now. It's kind of tabled. Um, and part of it is that um, books are a lot of work to write and um, advances are even getting smaller and smaller if you can get one these days, you know, and it's, I mean, if you're going to get two, three or $5,000, that's all someone's going to offer you on the book. Um, with the number of books I've written, the fees from consulting you know, on, you know, a film or a game or anything else far, far exceed probably what the book will actually end up selling. And it's in some ways acts as a deterrent to write another one. So i be more careful about what I want to write because, you know, it's, you put hundreds of hours into trying to write a book and that you might make, I mean, it may just not make much money out of it all. Or if you do, it's going to take years to get that money back while, somebody's willing to hire you as a consultant on a film or something and, you know, pay you up front 10 times as much money as you might make off the book. I mean, you can't get there without having the books, you know, because books are basically a credential establishing your expertise, you know, whether you're actually an expert or not, it's another question, but you know, the books make it look like you're an expert, at least in our society. Well, he wrote a book. He must know what he's talking about. Right. Um, so, uh, it's a book I'd like to write, but with all the other projects right now, I probably won't write it unless I can find a publisher willing to give me a decent amount of money up front to make it worth my while. Agents and publishers, uh, the only thing they know that actually sells is what's selling at the moment. That's yeah. why you see so much similarity in books. You know, Harry Potter came out and then all you saw in children's literature, you know, young adult literature, it was the same, you know, it was, it's all Harry Potter, basically. I don't care what the title was. They just changed things a little bit because it sells and mm. it's publishing business. And, if it works, they'll sell it, you know, and keep going. So it's, they really don't, they're really not the risk takers. They kind of present themselves, you know, they're going to discover the next great author. It's, someone asked me one time, it's, how do you get your book on the end cap, you know, in bookstores, you know, the, the books that are obviously really popular, they're there because they're popular. I said, no, they're there because the publisher paid a lot of money to have them displayed there. So hopefully they'll become popular, you know. Right. It's. Uh, what other projects are you currently working on? Uh, I actually have a couple of novels I'm working on. These are they're not pirate novels per se. Um, one is based on my experiences of that year in Alabama, that culture shock I experienced. Yeah. Um, it'll be fictional, but it'll be heavily based on that. Uh, there's another one um, because it's in some ways high concept. I probably won't say too much about it. It's a I might say it's a modern ghost story. Might have pirates in it. Um, <laughs> might. But again, it's this designed to be intended to be, you know, um, these are, uh, this one would be a much lighter work. The other one would be a bit more serious because it'd be covering civil rights in the deep South and, mm. um, yeah. a ghost I actually saw a serious one or well, I actually not a ghost, but what most people think is a ghost. I actually woke up when I was 10 years old in that year of Alabama state with my grandparents out in the woods, you know, way out in the country. And I woke up and looked out and there's a silver ball floating through the yard. And to this day, I don't know what it was. I assume it was probably ball lightning, but you know the novel will be called treasure light and it'll be you know built around that scene that i saw and uh, a lot of other things the um ghost story itself the other novel will be lighter you know much more lighter it's just going to be fine in fact it's the only thing the introduction that i wrote is the only thing i've ever written that my wife read and said i'd actually like to read this <laughs> i'm sure she hasn't read any of my books and it's probably not going to and that's uh -huh. not well, I mean, everything is subjective, writing is subjective. Yeah, you read what you like to read, and you know, it's not, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. She every once in a while say, you know, I still haven't read any of your books. I'm like, well, you know, but we don't have that kind of, I bet there's some pompous writers in the world, and I bet some of them and their, some of the, the male writers, their wives will say, yes, I'm the, the author's wife, and I'm here to support it. And it's like, oh, well, my wife is my companion and my 
you know, soulmate and my friend and, you know, I write books, but my relationship with her is in no way subordinate to that. And yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's nothing like that. I don't know that I'm explaining myself well, but you know, the fact that mm. she might not read my books doesn't bother me in the least, yeah. you know, it's because our relationship is not based on, you know, whether I write books or not write books, I suspect we'd be together no matter what, you know, mm. it's you know, not, nothing like that at all. No, I remember, I remember you said in the, um, last time we talked that you, um, that, that a lot of people have, um, their sort of their projects as their legacy, but you kind of see more your, mm -hmm. uh, children, uh, as your legacy. Oh, oh, by far. I even had someone ask me at an interview or some little talk I gave one time and says, so your books are like your children. And I'm like, no, my children. And I think I said this last time, my children are like my children, you know, um, it's, I, yeah, it's, I enjoy writing and I really would promote writing for a, a lot of people. I mean, even if you never get your book published, write it. It's for me when I write, I don't have a complete outline. I outline it, but I really learn and get insights from the process of writing itself. I know a lot of writers say that's not how they do it. I'm not sure I believe it, but for me, the actual process of physically writing it tends to put things together in my mind, and there's a lot of insights I get out of it. So, from that perspective, I strongly recommend writing, even if you never get the book published. You could have the manuscript, try to have your kids or grandkids publish it one day, or at least let them read it, uh, something. So. Uh, for me, writing is a useful tool for not just expressing myself, but for learning things about myself and about the world around me and everything else. It kind of forces me to address things and and write. So, no, and I think that's a good um, that's a good sort of conclusion to wrap things up on. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, why don't we finish up with the uh, with the fun questions? Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the first one is um, uh, who was your favorite character in the uh, that that one TV series that you worked on, uh, Black Sails? Uh, uh, they're gonna hate me for saying this, but I'm probably gonna say Woods Rogers. Um, why, why would they hate you for doing that? And who are they? they? Well, they, you know, they necessarily made him into the uh, the, the showrunners on it. They necessarily made him into the villain. And I think I mentioned last time that it was I had this suspicion when I started seeing um, the first footage, you know, coming on that they may have somehow based them on, you know, my character or my behaviors and you know some of the meetings and things that we had. But you know. He's uh, he's probably my favorite, and I figured that if if they'd let me be with Rogers, um, it, uh, you know, it wouldn't have been a debacle on the beach and all the other things that turned out badly. And I, I think the real with Rogers would have handled things quite a bit better, um, more successfully in there. But um, again, Black Sails is one of those things that's like um, the Peter Pan, where you like it, but I, it's hard for me to identify particularly with any one character. Mm um in it per, in it um uh, per se other than that i like flint um i'm probably a little bit partial to him my one of my adult daughters is a was a big fan of him and his mother mm. um and i think i mentioned i wouldn't i don't ask actors for pictures but i did for my daughter's sake you know for him one of the producers said yeah here i'll take your pictures and i sent it to her and yeah. she was overjoyed you know but yeah he did an excellent job in that role so mm. um I'd, I'd probably put them right about up there with um, the gentleman who played Woods Rogers. They did it's very very good acting. I thought he thought he carried the character off very well. Um, that character could have been uh, it would have been easy to really do that character poorly. I think, and I think he did it very well. Um, it's not quite my entire vision of um, Flint, but it's I think he, they did a uh, the writers did a good job the way they characterized him the way they set him up and in some ways he's probably the most admirable i think of all the mm. um, characters in the show mm. um, i have my own ideas when it comes to billy bones and long john silver you know yeah uh, very different characterizations that i saw in the series there but flint um he could i could actually see myself imagining flint something like that mm. yeah for sure yeah. So uh, last time I asked what uh, myth or tropes about sea rovers that you dislike the most. Uh, today I'm going to be a mm -hmm. bit more positive and ask which ones you enjoy the most. <laughs> uh, tropes, uh, let's see. The ones I like the most. Um, it's probably buried treasure. I mean, that's oh. probably one that I said that annoys me the most too. But, you know, it's, yeah. you know... Uh, my son's digging. He's, we got holes all over our yard from him. He's looking for buried treasure, and if it's not buried treasure, it's dinosaur bones. You know, he's digging holes everywhere. There's, it's just um, the 
uh, you know, that serious novel I was talking about will have something to do with, you know, treasure seeking. Um, it's just something inside us that we all want to find. It's a kind of easy way out, the mystery associated with it, you know, plus happy wealth, you know, the um, uh, Count of Monte Cristo, you know, kind of thing. You suddenly, you know, you, you find this treasure. And, and uh, even for me doing research is like finding, you know, digging up buried treasure. You just find mm. these nuggets every once in a while. But, you, know, you fall on a map and, you know, by Jove, it was there, you know, or you find out that that plot device you put in there actually existed in history. So that's probably the one I like that it, in spite of the fact that I, I, I know there's no such thing as pirate. What's your favorite pirate ship type is the, is the next question. Uh, that would probably be a, a small frigate, something roughly the equivalent of a, an English six raid or what the French would have called a frigate legere, you know, something that, that probably has no more than about 16 guns on the main deck and it might have two or four small, very small guns on the quarter deck. Uh, these were about, uh, there were occasionally some pirate buccaneer ships larger than this, but they were fairly rare. This is a, a ship that could actually threaten smaller men of war. Um, it was very versatile, usually swift. Um, you put a large crew on it, and it's that classic three-mast, late 17th century ship. Right, well, uh, moving on to the uh, to the last question. Uh, I'm also getting hungry, so I want to go and eat. Uh, yeah, I'm getting hungry too. My wife is probably about, movie's probably about over upstairs. Oh my God. Yeah, the the kids are going to run in with the swords and everything. Oh uh, yeah, I told her probably be an hour, hour and a half. We're the love of that, so. <laughs> but uh, who's your favorite sea rover uh, from the Golden Age? Uh, that's almost certainly Lawrence de Graaf, the... Um, the Dutchman who went into Spanish service as a gunner with, with the Armada de Barlavanto. It was, you know, went to the Americas. He actually married a woman in the Canary Islands, went to the uh, Americas with the, the Americas with the Spanish. They were based out of Veracruz, was aboard, I think, a pirate hunting uh, Guarda Costa um, local vessel. They got captured by uh, French filibusters and he joined them. And he very quickly worked his way up from, you know, this very small French bark log up to capturing sloops and larger vessels. And he was, uh, he's what Hollywood, what we'd all like to think of is almost that um, classic gentleman or semi-gentleman swashbuckling buccaneer. He could actually fight, you know, he could fight a ship well. You know, he actually fought single engagements against Spanish ships and won. Um, he was trapped after the, the sack of um, Campeche in 1685 by the Armada de Balavanto, the, the two flagships. And his vessel, I actually found the records. It was a captured Spanish slaver. It was a little over uh, 300 tons, a fairly small vessel. He had 30 to 40 guns on it. Uh, I mean, great guns, cannon, and with some smaller swivels on it. And he was fighting two ships, each in tonnage, probably twice or more his size. And one of them probably had about 48 great guns on it. The other had about 54 or 56 and he fought both of them simultaneously to a draw i mean he got battered badly but this is a i mean it's an incredible feat that two ships that size he battered them. one of the spanish ships fired 60 broadsides at him and at the end of the day he was still afloat and they went licked their wounds and didn't come back they sailed away the next morning and he managed to escape and it's a lot of escapades like this he uh, married a very wealthy widow on saint domingue um and grew even wealthier that way, he became a French naval officer and you know, was part of the defense of um, working to defend Saint-Domingue against the English, not as successfully as I think the French would have, government would have liked, but um, he, what else? He's, he fought the duel with Van Horn on Sacrificios Island. I mean, there's no better place. I mean, two pirate captains fighting, a, you know, having a sword fight on an island named Sacrificios. Um, after the sack of Vera Cruz, he divorced. Oh, he married that rich widow. He divorced. He got a divorce from his first wife in the Canary Islands. I don't know how you get a divorce back then, but he got a divorce. It's they have the formal pay for it in the notation, so he could marry the rich widow. You know, um, he also had to get a pardon from the from Louis, um, so that he could become a French officer because he had. I'm not sure he actually killed Van Horn. Van Horn might have died from gangrene or he may have died from pestilence that swept the, the crews after that. But anyway, then they had a duel, Van Horn died, so he had to get a pardon for, you know, dueling. And well, just this very colorful character, uh, Excamelling, who probably met him, Excamelling probably came back with the 
expedition, appears to have come back with the expedition against Cartagena in 1697. So he probably met um, de Graff and he certainly knew, had met people who knew him well, but he said that it, 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 um, de Graff's, the height of his fame, you know, he had a whole posse following him and he had, you know, violinists and everybody playing yeah. for him and he, they'd follow in his, in his wake and he had them play for him and play for everybody else. And just this popular character, big Spanish, style, blonde haired, tall, big, you know, big Spanish, very Dutch looking, I imagine, <laughs> very Spanish style, handlebar type mustache. And, you know, Sabatini appropriated some of his acts and uh, he had a different character, but you could see a lot of the graph in um, Peter Blood. You know, just that whole panache and, you know, the success and the tactical success and everything else. That's doing up there. Um, so, yeah, probably by far, he would, he'd be my favorite. If I had to pick a second one, it'd probably be Bartholomew Sharp, because in some ways, uh, they're almost two sides of the corn. Sharp is kind of that, you know, that semi-lovable renegade. Yeah. He was a, a brilliant tactician, but he's also... Uh, he had a lot of character flaws, you know, he was mm -hmm. deposed, you know, from command because people just didn't like his attitude. You know, he mm -hmm. was gambling with his people. And basically, if you're you, you can't be a commanding officer and take your people's money away from them, whether it's, you know, by playing dice or anything else, you're going to get become unpopular. But then, you know, he was put back in the command when he rescued them during a, a near savage defeat by the Spanish. He rallied everybody. And, yeah, you know, he, yeah. Um, he snuck off with the French, which was at Campeche. He was at the sack of Campeche, which was pure piracy under English law. They would have hanged him for it. And to uh, cover his butt from that, he went out and got a, a dubious commission as a pirate hunter. He said, oh, no, I'm, I'm not a pirate. I'm serving the crown. And when he went up to Bermuda to sell his cargo of slaves, uh, he found that there was a very Tea Party-ish rebellion, uh, Trumpish Tea Party-ish rebellion against the local government. And he sided with the local government, you know, the, you know, against the rebels and help put the you know rebellion down again. He was tried for piracy twice and acquitted twice. You know? Yeah. So he'd probably be my second favorite. I don't really identify with him, but I'd said something yeah. earlier about like if I was a naval officer, or Navy SEAL. I knew people like that, and he's definitely a, a character that I've known people just like that. You know, they're brilliant in the field and you want them by your side, but they're you know they, they have enough character flaws that they always seem to be in trouble too. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating period. It's a lot of fascinating characters in it. And again, I'll I can't say this too many times. I find these people far more fascinating than any of the early 18th century pirates that everybody makes so much of. Mm. I mean, there's just no comparison between a De Graff and a or a Sharp, and even the so-called greatest of the early 18th century pirates. Yeah. They're just there's just more character there and more success and you know better martial skills, and, you know better leaders and just all around. And again, that may be an artifact. That, you know, my own interests and prejudices, but, you know, no, I no. wouldn't. Yeah, well, I, uh, I think that's, a, I think that's a good note to end on. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, you go, yeah. you got to look at something else than just the, uh, the still picture of me with the mixing bowl. <laughs> I was going to comment on that early on and I try to change backgrounds too this time since yeah. the kids are upstairs. So it, it seemed to have worked out. So I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Yeah. It's, yeah, well, I'll, uh, and by the way, I had a lot of I had a lot of compliments on your interviewing oh, yeah. skills. Oh yeah, well, thank you. Some people letting me know that they, they enjoyed the podcast a lot. I oh, yeah. thought you did a very good job on it. So. That was good. Well, I'm, I mean, I I enjoy it, and I mean, you tend to do well what you enjoy. So, um, I mean, there, there's always there's always a lot to talk about with you. So you know, maybe we'll do this again in the future. Uh, I'll make sure to hit you up. And um, all right, thank you much. Yeah, well, I'll see you later. All right, thanks much. Thank you everyone for listening to the podcast. If you want to learn more about Benison Little and his written works, please check out the links in the video description. If you're hungry for more podcasts by yours truly, uh, I can only recommend the previous episodes. While I do enjoy making these, it's a lot of fun to talk to these people, as you might notice, uh, they do not give me a lot of use and thus aren't profitable for me to produce. If I'd get a large amount of channel members or Patreon supporters that would explicitly want these, I'd definitely make more, but at the moment it is not worth it. As you saw from the episode on Benjamin Horningold, I do try to interview the regular episodes with the interviews, and I do have one more podcast planned. But it will not come out until a few years. Huge thanks to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Special thanks to my shareholder tier supporters, Cole Freer, Max Twick, Mikhail Jans, 1660, and Daniel Stryker. If you want to support me monetarily, 
please check out the links to PayPal or Patreon in the video description. If you want to otherwise support the channel, hit the subscribe and notification button. Share the video with a friend, like the video, and tell me in the comments what you liked or disliked about this one, and what you want to see next. Cheers.